In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. For all intensive purposes, when someone has committed a faux pas, by incorrectly using or pronouncing a well-known phrase, most everyone agrees that he should not be able to get away scotch-free and should instead receive correction as his just deserves for giving his own flawed version of whatever phrase he has butchered. Okay, so maybe I'm being a little bit tongue and cheek here, and perhaps you think this is all just a mute point. Who cares about how phrases commonly used in our language are misheard, or misused, or mispronounced, or misspoken? Well, perhaps this is my last-stitch effort to show you that some wordings, and the way they are worded, can turn heads, or even offend. Our Gospel reading picks up from last week as we continue through John chapter 6. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. These words point us to how valuable it is to be connected to Jesus Christ. In Him, our needs are met, all of them. He provides for us through His loving and generous hand. This is why He came into the world as the bread that came down from heaven. And while He chooses His words well and gets nothing wrong about who He is, it is clear that His words are not fully embraced. He says, I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Remember now, the crowd that was there was there for their own reasons, and not to graciously receive all that he offers to cover their every need. He says earlier, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. The miracle that resulted in 12 baskets of leftovers was not quickly leaving the minds of those who had been there, or perhaps some newcomers who had merely heard about it. They wanted more, but they were not looking to Jesus in the way that He would have Himself be seen. They thought they knew what He came here to do, and they had it wrong. He was addressing their false view of him now as some kind of meal ticket. But Jesus does not only leave them with a reprimand. He works to address their misunderstanding and to straighten it out. He shows us that for all intents and purposes, he came into our flesh not to offer a free meal whenever one was needed, but instead to do the will of the Father. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Not everyone believes in the one whom the Father sent for the purpose of redeeming sinful mankind. Not everyone believes in the one with a faith that lines up with how he actually describes himself. All those who reject who Jesus is, therefore, is guilty of something far more serious than a spiritual faux pas. People who do not acknowledge and repent of their sin will by no means get away scot-free and will instead be separated from Christ's loving presence in eternity as their just deserts. But our Lord came here to rescue people, to rescue us from that punishment. He says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. The crowd that is gathered here following the feeding of the 5,000 is wrong about who Jesus is. While they likely just want another free meal, they also want to confirm that Jesus is who they want Him to be. They're desperate to hear him verify their own opinions on his role in this world as the one sent by the Father. And from the look of it, they are not willing to fully embrace the ultimate miracle of the cross for which he was sent. 
This unbelief, which Jesus already rebuked them for, persists. John writes, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And here we find the turning of a phrase leading to the turning of heads. Jesus uses the words, I am, or in the Hebrew, Yahweh, which is in fact the description he gave to himself when speaking with Moses from within the burning bush. This right here is the closest phrase that has been given to make a name for God, and its utterance was always to be used only in correct reference to God under the penalty of death. These Jews did not accept Jesus' explanation of his own divinity. They rejected his being Yahweh. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? They were taking offense at the comparison he was drawing to himself as the providing hand of the Lord that was opened to the Israelites during their wandering years in the wilderness. They falsely find that he is misusing a very important phrase, and they refuse to listen to or accept his words. Their reaction moves from grumbling to full-scale rejection, and there is nothing tongue-in-cheek about this. I assure you it is no moot point. They respond in anger as the Savior addresses their sinful misperception and the ways that it was twisting their minds and turning them against their Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. And we come under this same temptation. We yearn for our own version of God and His teaching, and as we reach for it, we reject the way, the truth, and the life, and the only means by which we can approach our Father in heaven. Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and He has revealed Himself to be more than an important prophet or a wise teacher or a man able to perform amazing acts and miracles. He knew precisely what He was saying when He described Himself as the great I Am and compared His flesh to the miraculous bread of heaven that brings freedom from sin and damnation. Certainly, we today appreciate these truths about Jesus, but like the crowds, there are other difficult aspects of His eternal identity and how He shows Himself to be that are quite tempting to disassociate from or outright reject. The crowds wanted Jesus on their own terms, just as we do. Jesus came to them and to this world in order to remove sin and to reestablish our connection to God our Father. And this came not by our plan or even by our request. He went to the cross while we, dead in our sins and incapable of appreciating His love and favor, reject who He says He is. In our sinfulness, we want Jesus to be the kind of God who looks the other way as we chase after the self-serving thoughts, words, and actions that we embrace to satisfy our desires. We want to twist His Word and its proper application to our lives and the life of the church in ways similar to what is done with many common phrases in the English language. We want Him to be more culturally sensitive and understanding, and we want Him to lay aside some of the harder or sharper edges of His law to accommodate for a more modern way of thinking. We want Him to ignore the ways that we ignore His law, because doing things our way is far more comfortable and preferable. But Jesus would not bend to the rejection of the crowd in our reading. Likewise, He will not bend to the ways that we insist on an erroneous version of Him and His Word. Instead, He bends and writhes and struggles in pain as He goes on and suffers on the cross. And there on the cross, He shows what mankind's sinful rejection of God's true Word brings about, a holy wrath which has been satisfied by His sacrifice. 
In his love, he gave his body and shed his blood willingly in order to redeem us. This saving work is the reason for which he came into his creation, as he explained to the crowd in our reading. This was no last-ditch effort or one final attempt to gain attention. The cross and resurrection is not what he eventually went to after people stopped wanting more miracles from him. The cross and the resurrection are the very will of the Father, and Jesus Christ accomplished it for you. Anyone who rejects this work, anyone who twists its truth or relays it incorrectly, and anyone who ignores what God shows us in His Word as it points to our Savior from sin will undergo eternal yet deserved punishment. This is God's proper response to our sin. And it is all the more fitting when looking at the promise that Jesus Christ suffered that punishment completely and in our place. We as God's baptized people then, who have been physically joined to Christ's death and resurrection and taken in as His believing children, are to recognize this promise, to live under it and reflect it, and to reflect His love to those around us. It comes first to us freely and regularly right here in worship. This church serves as a place where anyone can hear and be joined to the truth of who Jesus is, even as He describes we ourselves are invited each week to hear the Word and receive Christ's very body and blood given and shed for us to eat and to drink so that we can be sure of the truth that our sins are forgiven. His promise is that His love never changes and that it will always be found in its clear truth and delivered through His means of grace. Amen. We continue now with the singing of the offertory on page 192. Please stand.